Hello, Melbourne. <laughs> uh, so welcome to Sonar Solutions for Accessible Gaming. Um, I'm Xander Hume. I am a game audio designer, and I direct a little company called Supertonic. And basically, that's uh, like a little team. You hire a freelance like audio director to join your project, and I sort of organize anything that makes a sound, I take care of it. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's all me, but sometimes the best person with the job is someone else, or it's a big project, and I put a team together, and we make some cool sounds for you. <laughs> and uh, I'm not an expert on blindness, uh, despite that being the topic of this talk, but I am an expert on listening, which I think is very important here. Yeah. Um, but it's also why I consulted a number of people with uh, blindness and low vision to help me out here. Um, and learned some really interesting and insightful things. And I've got some uh, links at the end if you want to look at the material from some of these wonderful people who've helped me out. So, um, really, uh, I, I usually would go into a really technical talk um, and look at how to actually execute all these sorts of things, but I, I realize that's probably lost on a lot of the people that want or need to hear this talk. And it's the kind of stuff you can really research and, and learn from other people and and all that sort of thing. So I'd really like to actually cover more core, like fundamental, like almost like an ideology for it. Because um, I want, I think the really important things are cultivating a curious mindset and listening to your surroundings, listening to your colleagues, listening to marginalized voices, and listening to your heart, listening to the beat, listening to the rhythm, the rhythm of the street. So I'd like to... Um, if, if, uh, if you'll indulge me, um, I'd like to, at some point this week, I think, it'd be nice if you could try and engage in this exercise in, in sort of audio curiosity. Um, because I think if you want to be a good sound designer, you need to be curious. And that's sort of a driving, <laughs> really a driving force uh, behind good sound design. And it will also help you when you come to want to design uh, accessible sound design for your game. This is really what you need to do. So I've got here a about listening out for a sound you can hear but not see, and if you know what it is, a passing motorbike, for example, ask yourself, why do I know this? Is it because it has a particular quality to its sound that makes it very unique and recognizable? Is it because of the context that I'm hearing it in? I, I'm next to a street, therefore it's more likely to be a, a motorbike than a helicopter or something? Um, or is it because of a sort of a cultural context as well that, you know, you know when you hear the particular Melbourne clack, 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 that that's the crosswalk signs here, but um, we up in Queensland, we've got a blip, 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 instead, um, which might be, yeah, a bit confusing if you hadn't heard those, especially in, um, in Japan, a lot, a lot of crosswalks have different bird sounds and things, um, and a, a lot of other cool stuff. <laughs> but after you've weighed up all these things, think, can I steal this? Is there anything about this sound that I can use myself to communicate something to players? And um, I think if, if you want an exercise you can do right here, well not right here, right here, but in this building, uh, there's a balcony out that way past the toilets as you go into the upstairs seats for the plenary and whatnot. And if you walk along that balcony, you'll notice if you close your eyes and listen, you'll hear out on one side the hubbub of all talking voices and people outside, the great cavernous reverb for the huge area, the hard glass walls and solid floors that all this is reflecting off all those qualities, right? And on your right-hand side, you'll hear a carpeted wall and a carpeted floor, and it is dead as. There is no reverb and reflections in that area. It's very uh, claustrophobic almost. And if you turn around and walk around with your eyes shut, you may find you're able to navigate quite well through that space based on the cues from, from the surrounding area and the qualities of the sound and how the sound is reacting in those spaces. And you might even notice a very curious thing that if you clap very loudly, uh, as I want to do and uh, tends to startle people, uh, <laughs> but if you do that, um, you'll notice not much of a reverb in your current surroundings and then a sort of an echo that goes out into the wider space. And, and this is almost sonar, in a sense, you know. Um, this is what we can use to 
understand the space around us. And it's what a lot of blind people use as well. And um, you can do sounds you make yourself, which is like active sonar. You can do like passive sonar where you just listen to the space and you can hear that there's a wall right next to you because it feels very different indeed. So these are sorts of things you should be trying to think about um, just in data life in general, if you can. So I'd like you to think about channels of communication whenever you're designing anything for your game. So for a feature, let's say, right? So we want to communicate it visually. We want to communicate it through audio. We want to communicate it through haptics if we can. And, I don't know, like taste, smell, your sense of dread, whatever senses you've got that you think you can play to, um, you know. So, uh, you know, for example here, we've got traffic lights, right? Traffic lights, they're visual. Their audience is drivers, right? There is no other sensory information here for traffic lights, unless you want to take into account, like, the context of listening out to what other cars are doing and that sort of thing. But that's not perfect. You could be the only person at a traffic light you need to be able to see it. And that's because the audience needs good vision. You're not allowed to drive if you've got low vision or no vision. Um, you know, if you're legally blind, you can't legally drive. Um, pedestrian crossings, on the other hand, you've got the visual, you've got the audio, you've got the haptics. If you actually, if you touch the plate that makes that tapping sound, you can feel it. So even if you can't see it and can't hear it, you've still got an indication of whether it's safe to cross the road. And that's because the audience for this is Oh, no, you can't taste it, sorry. Uh, the audience for this is everybody. Um, and that's, there's something in that that I think is, is worth considering that if you get to a point where you're designing something for a particular audience and you're like, oh, can I tack on something to make it more accessible? You've already sort of got a wrong audience in a sense. Like, you need to be thinking from an early, an early stage about how can I communicate through as many channels of information as possible. And the other thing there is the curb cutter effect. Because if you're a pedestrian with perfect eyesight and perfect hearing, and you come up to one of these crossings, if you, have you ever been at a crossing where the clacker is broken and the light turns on and you're like, oh shit, you know. Because we're used to receiving all this information. It's, it's not just, just for people who need these things. It's so useful for everybody. And you know, you'll find that the more channels of communication you use in everything you're trying to communicate in your game, it's going to benefit everybody uh, in the way they play. So the problem is not that blind people are blind. The problem is that games don't cater enough to people with low and no vision. And I went to a great talk by Ian Hamilton here a few years ago where I, I think he was quoting someone else again, so it's a double quote. But he described um, disability not as a thing a person has, but disability is a design issue when something you have designed cannot be used by someone and that's, that's a disability issue. You know, it, it is in the design, it's not in the person. So I, I think it may come as a surprise to some people that blind people do play video games, really. Um, and here's a bunch of streamers you can, you can watch, if you like, and listen to um, playing games even though they are legally or totally blind. Uh, and there's plenty of them, and of course there are a lot of people who play games and don't stream. Um, there really are a lot of people out there. And the, it may surprise you, like, exactly what games people can actually manage without vision. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. But I'd like to talk about this sort of thing, because um, when a lot of people think blindness, you think, okay, total blackness. Um, but then again, you don't even see blackness if it's total blindness. It's, uh, if you close one eye, what do you see out of that eye now? Anyone? <laughs> right, if there is a bright light, you may start to see something through that. But it just sort of suddenly, this is your field of vision now. I don't see anything over here, even darkness. It's just gone. And so for people with total uh, no light perception, it's just like that, but with both eyes, um, which is a weird thought. And I cannot grok that, it's, it's wild. But looking at some different sort of, I'm not going to say it like degrees, um, but different types you might want to consider. Color blindness, low vision, legally blind, and no light perception. And you can be, so there's you know, a definition for each of these, but generally, you know, um, legally blind people can see some light. And sometimes that's, they can see from you know, very close up and everything is very blurry, or it could be a type of tunnel vision, or you can have cortical blindness or like motion blindness even, where you just see like strobe 
frames. It's, um, it's a lot of different uh, ways that people can have their uh, vision impaired. But um, this is, I think, my key point, really, which is that you've got a whole spectrum, right, you could say, of accessibility when you're designing a game, right? And if you've got, you know, say, points on this scale where a game could be played by someone with low vision or could only be played by someone with near, like, 20-20, perfect eyesight, right? And you think, well, I've got a game that can only be played by people with low vision, definitely not color blindness, uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely not um, legal blindness. Why do I even bother making it slightly more accessible? Because maybe your game sits there. Maybe somewhere on this threshold, you can make a tiny improvement to your game which nudges it over the boundary for someone who couldn't play your game before and now can play and enjoy your game. And that is so huge. Like, it's just, it's, it's amazing. You know, like there's so many thresholds along here where you're locking people out every little bit of less accessible it, um, your game becomes. So I'll, let's look at some games that do this well. Um, first one, look at Space Channel 5 because it's so un un unlike um, a lot of rhythm action games. Rhythm action games are so often a, a lovely pairing of audio and visual together, think like Guitar Hero, where you see the notes come along and you play them on your, your fake guitar, but the notes don't actually correspond directly to what you're hearing. It's an approximation because you've only got five buttons, so they just sort of put all the notes into those five sort of spots, and it's, it's really, you can't just play that game listening to it and know what notes need to be played. There are blind people that play Guitar Hero and there's a lot of sort of trial and error involved in things in learning a piece by, you know, knowing where it needs to go by hearing where it fails, um, which is a tremendous effort. I just can't imagine doing that. Um, but it is, you know, not, not that accessible. But uh, I'll just show you the video, shall I? <laughs> Which is wonderful, isn't it? Um, and this whole game, so long, as, so long as you can at some point glean the information that A is chew and B is hay, you don't have to look at this game to play it at all. It's all about rhythm and timing and, and not like key combinations which are announced for you. Um, it's, it's fantastically accessible, it's wonderful. Um, and it's just a great approach that you couldn't tack onto a rhythm game. Like, that needs to be in the design from really early on. Uh, here's another example of a game that is played at competitive levels by blind people, by people with no light perception at all, can play this game. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for this. There's really good um, spatialization of the sounds. We probably can't hear it terribly well in this space, but if you're playing with headphones on, you can hear exactly where on the screen anything is happening. Any sound comes from a very specific place in your stereo field. The other thing is that every single action in this game, every move has a unique sound. Everything is slightly different. You can learn what every move sounds like. And then the, the third thing is actually that all of the menus are narrated by the announcer of the game who says, fight. He goes through and if you switch this on, um, it's not ideal because you do have to go through a whole lot of menus to get to this feature. But if you switch this on, he will narrate the contents of all the menus and where your cursor is at so that you can navigate through the game menus just by sound. So let's um, just have a listen to this um, and yeah, see if you can follow what's going on, maybe closing your eyes occasionally. <laughs> Oh, 
Good grief, those crunchy sounds are a bit intense. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really uh, remarkable, and I do urge you to, if you haven't played the game, have a listen to it um, with headphones on, because uh, it's just spectacularly well done. They've got a great sound team. The other sort of game that does this really well are audio games, which you may not have heard of, but are basically sounds that either don't need or don't have any visuals at all. And this can take the uh, you know, form of, of sort of a text adventure style thing, or all sorts actually. Um, there are a lot of um, mobile games that are audio only. Um, it's yeah, it's a really interesting um, area. And uh, basically, all text adventures, even though you think, well, that's only visual, should be readable and playable with a screen reader, um, which yeah, really opens up a whole lot of stuff. You'd think, well, you know, just visual, but actually, can be just audio. So when do we want to think about accessibility when we're designing sound for our games? Well, I'm going to do the thing that every single audio talk always does every time, which is you should get audio involved right near the start. Um, and it is kind of important to have it, at least to think about it in the concept phase. If you can't afford to have an audio person on your payroll from day dot, it's understandable. Um, <laughs> but you should be thinking about sound and concepting and talking to people about it and figuring out what it is you can do. Because when you introduce uh, these features and concepts early on, it can really permutate what, what, uh, sorry, mutate what happens to the game as it, as it develops. Things can really hinge on these features, uh, and, and yeah, it can really change things. Um, I wish I could tell you about all the cool things that we've got going in the current title I'm working on, but I can't yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's suffice it to say that spatialization can absolutely change how uh, a game is perceived or how much information you think needs to be conveyed visually uh, and this sort of thing. So I'd like to run you through my sound design process for this because this is, I mean, you know, this is kind of the nuts and bolts of it when you're thinking about what accessible sound design really means, right? So I will, uh, you know, project lead will say we've got a brief for a new feature. It's a deployable shield zone. The player can throw it, and then it makes a shield zone, and you get a defense buff when you're inside it. Cool, great. What do we need to do for this for audio? Well, first I'm thinking you need an equipping sound. There needs to be a unique sound. When you're going through all your equipment or whatever, you equip this item, the player knows you've got the shield zone now. That's been equipped. The next thing you need to know is a charging sound. So if it's, it's deployable, if you throw it, you need to know how far you're going to throw it. And sure, maybe you could have a visual indicator on screen, but you also need to have some sort of charging up or like a, whatever it is that helps indicate what between like 0% throw and like 100% throw you're doing so you can see, tell how far you're throwing it with that timing, okay? Next, you need a throwing sound. So to make it very unequivocally clear, you released this, the thing and it's being thrown now and that's the moment when that happened um, because maybe there's some sort of delay or something happens that interrupts that, you know, this all needs to be very clearly conveyed. A flying through the air sound is really important for this sort of thing because this is where spatialization really kicks in because you can have uh, the Doppler effect attached to it, you can have really clear spatialization so that you can follow in your mind's eye or ear? No, your real ear, your mind's eye, the trajectory of this thing you're throwing and where it's landing, how far away it's going and it's where reverb and things and, and probably like having reverb in your spaces really kicks in as well because that can tell you more about your environment as well as, as what you're doing right now. So, you know, where the shield zone is going to land. Then you need a landing sound to know that it's stopped moving, so you can pinpoint, but okay, it's there now. Okay, so then you need an activating sound, so you know the shield zone is now active, okay, because that's important information. <laughs> and then you need an active loop, so while the shield zone is still active, it needs to may have a little hum or whatever sound you're gonna put in there, that's ongoing so that when a, your player is moving around, they can tell where they are located related to it as they approach it. They can tell that it is still active and that if they get to it, that they'll get the shield buff. 
then you need a deactivating sound, because it's also very important to know your buff is no longer in effect. Um, so that needs to be in there. Then you also need a sound for when you're entering the zone. Because although you might think very clear visually, you enter this zone, you're in there now. Um, but you need some sort of sound cue as well, because just everything needs you know, more channels of communication if you can put them in there. And then, of course, one for if you're exiting the zone, because that's also important. And if you want to get finickety about it, maybe you've got like other things that give you shield buffs in the game, and there's a specific shield buff sound that you want to have as a UI sound in there as well. Um, so there really is just an, an awful lot <laughs> to, to consider for every single little thing. Um, but it's, it's hugely, hugely important. And um, it's just, I, I think that's maybe the hardest thing here if you're not like audio minded um, to try and think about what would it be like whenever you're th concepting a feature, what would it be like to interact with this feature if I can't see it? And how do I deal with that <laughs> as an issue? Um, so, um, I'd like to thank a couple of people who really helped me with this um, and shared their experiences. Uh, I got some great pointers from Accessibility Unlocked, who uh, launched recently, and they're a wonderful resource, both for people who want to learn about accessibility and people who need to learn about things that exist to help support people who need um, accessibility features. Um, Screen Queensland, who uh, helped fund me coming down here, and uh, I work in their co-working office, which is really lovely. I get to work with other game developers there, and it's really nice. Um, Vision Australia, I had a bit of a chat with. You can get uh, simulation glasses from them for free. You don't have to be like a doctor or anything. Um, you can call them up and say, I want five pairs of glaucoma glasses and five pairs of, you know, you can get, they've got five different um, visual impairment types represented in the glasses and you can get five of each, up to five of each for free and they'll just post them to you and you can use those. Because it's one thing to go, Okay, if I play my game with my eyes closed, I can't tell what I'm doing. But that's not everybody. You know, like, if you want to try and make it slightly more accessible for people with low vision and not completely no vision, then having these sorts of tools can really help you be like, okay, can I tell what's going on if the screen is incredibly blurry? Can I tell what's going on with, uh, in these different situations? And, and uh, that may help. But yeah, free resource. Wonderful. Um, Drew Taylor gave me some wonderful pointers and things about his experience um, and what he found particularly useful uh, when he's playing games. Um, Brandon Cole does some really great videos on this kind of stuff. Um, he actually did a good video on uh, the sonar sort of effect and, and doing that yourself and learning to recognize the shape of your surroundings and things by using little clicks and other sounds. Um, and then uh, Dan Vogt is a lovely, lovely, lovely guy. Um, who hangs out with us up in Brisbane, um, and he's, he's legally blind, and he gave me some great pointers on this sort of thing as well. Um, and uh, you should also play Data Wing, because it's a really good game. <laughs> and you might cry, I don't know. Um, but, yes. Anyway, uh, we've, got, we've got some time for questions. We've got, we've got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Oh, yeah, if you want to come up to the... Is there a game that demonstrates the specialization aspect very well? Well, Mortal Kombat 11 is a really good example of that. Um, there are a whole lot of really good games, like, I mean, Overwatch, for example, is a great one. Um, if you play that and, and just sort of listen out, you can hear that every character in the game has a different footstep sound that's uniquely identifiable, and you can hear where they are, whether they're behind a wall, and... and so much more just from listening to just the footsteps of the players, let alone everything else that's going on in that game. It's, it's really well specialized. Um, and you can do a lot of, like a lot of this stuff can be done just like vanilla Unity, you know, for look at fancy plugins. You may want to look at some HRTF uh, stuff because there are, uh, sorry, head related transfer function, uh, which is basically like a binaural recording thing, if everyone's familiar with that. So, like, if, if you record sound through, like, a little foam head that looks like a head um, and has ears and things uh, and record sounds around it, it basically has a psychoacoustic effect of when you listen back to that of you being in that space. Because uh, the reason we can tell the sound is behind us or in front of us is because of the shape of our head and the shape of our ears, ears and that sort of thing, right? 
And the reason you can tell it's over here or over here, partially volume from left to right, but also a very slight delay in the time that it takes for the sound to reach this ear and that ear and that sort of thing. And there are plugins out there that will help you actually achieve that effect in your game. They're largely used in VR a lot, but you can put them into um, uh, like third, the third person and the first person games and, and that sort of stuff as well. And that really helps with spatialization, making it incredibly pinpoint precise. <laughs> Hi, um, <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, visually we get a lot of cues in games as to uh, how we should feel about certain things. Maybe red things are bad, blue things are good, or mm. red things are to do with attack and blue things are to do with defense. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, does that carry across into sounds? Do we have like, like sonic themes that follow through things that mm. give us information about that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like there's... Um, you know, sounds can have so many wonderful qualities, like <laughs> if you want to talk about like the rough or smooth or this sort of thing. It all sounds incredibly wanky. It's <laughs> any way of describing sound. Oh, this is very warm. Yeah. Mm. Um, no, it's, uh, there are sounds that have a lot of these qualities, um, especially if you play around with a synthesizer for any amount of time, you'll find there are sounds that are really mellow and, and soothing and, and uh, have lots of nice connotations to them and sounds that are really bright and harsh and biting and um, also we've got like a hundred years of cinema to draw on. Well, there wasn't sound for the first, <laughs> but we've got an awful lot of cinema to draw on for tropes and cultural mm. artifacts that we have about what sounds mean and how to use them and, and, and what different types of sounds actually communicate. You know, and if you make a shield zone, then there's all sorts of lovely harmonious sounds you can use to make that seem like a nice thing you want to get near. And when you pick up a coin, you get a really lovely tinkly sound and not a bang sort of, you know, that it doesn't even have to be that cliche. There is so much subtlety in, in what you put into a sound uh, which can determine whether it is going to seem like it's, it's got a particular cause or, or, or purpose. Cool, thanks. Hi, excellent talk, by the way. I actually wrote a paper on um, using... VR to uh, enable accessibility to visually impaired players. But oh, cool. one of the uh, questions that I was having is, do you have any guidelines for things like uh, trying not to overwhelm the player with noises? Obviously, if there's a lot of things in the environment, you want mm. them to be maybe aware of them. But is there any guideline mm. to uh, either breaking things up tonally or harmonically so that mm. you can distinguish them from you know every other sound that's playing at a time? Or do you limit it to a certain number? or yeah. Well, first of all, like, VR is so, like, such a good space for dealing with um, uh, visual impairment, like, because that spatialization I was talking about with the HRTF, right, if you're wearing headphones, you've got head tracking, it's amazing. It's just, oh, it's, it's so good. But yes, awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, actually, we can draw a whole lot from music producers uh, in this area, because uh, if you talk to really top level music producers and whatnot, they'll talk about sort of sonic space in a mix. Um, and they talk about music as three dimensional, basically. So you've got your panning from left to right. You've got various types of de delay and reverb, which give the impression of things being far away. And then volume sort of helps with that as well. And then you've got sort of sonic qualities, uh, tonal qualities that, that make something appear kind of high or low, right? And the, the, the audible human spectrum is technically 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Um, I would be surprised if most people in this room can hear above like 16 kilohertz, but it's, um, I mean, I can't hear above 16 kilohertz, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but uh, that's what you get for being a drummer. Uh, but there's, there's a whole lot of sonic space to play with there, right? And if you've got a lot of sounds that are hogging the same sort of key frequencies, they are going to get muddy and blend in with each other and be difficult to distinguish. So one thing you can do is look at this and when you're designing your important sounds to make sure they either take up largely specific sort of chunks of the frequency spectrum or that you're carving out little bits in your EQ to make room for these. So if you've got a sound here that's got a real peak at like 500 hertz or something and you've got another sound that's sort of much broader and covers a wide range of sound, you can EQ out the little bit at 500 hertz and it's not going to make the other sound sound too weird 
but when the 500 hertz sound comes through, it's going to pop through so much clearer because there's less information and energy going on in that area. So that's one thing you can do. Or the other thing you can do is have um, sidechain compression, where you've got a compressor that listens to uh, an external... Am I getting too technical with this? No, um, no, you're good. No, okay. So you've got a, a compressor that listens to an external input. So say you've got uh, some ambience in the room, right? Room tone, maybe there's like crowds or whatever else is going on, right? And you've got a gunshot sound, which you want to be super duper loud and very, very important. The gunshot sound can cause the ambient sound to be compressed. So what happens is gunshot sound happens and then, ooh, that was cool. Um, and then everything else gets quieter while that sound plays. And sometimes you can, do it, you can do it really subtly so that people listening don't even notice. They just feel like the gunshot's really loud. Or you can do it much more obviously where you really pull everything else down so that this really important thing stands out. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to handle that. Um, you know, if you're working on mobile or something, that's going to be very expensive to do on the fly. Um, but, you know, on console, you can manage some of that, uh, just not hundreds of them. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. I guess there's no more questions. Or... Oh. Do you know of any libraries that let you do um, really quite sophisticated audio processing on, for example, uh, mobile platforms? Um, well, the, I mean, the trouble with audio stuff, by and large, is that it's incredibly power hungry. It's, it's, uh, it's come from a sort of an area where it never used to be sort of like we wouldn't process actual recorded audio the way we do now on the fly. In, in you know, in games and things um, originally, like sure, if you're synthesizing things and working on a, an 8-bit or a 16-bit console, you can have like delays and other effects and things, um, and that was all sort of part of the part of the deal. But for a large period of time, we've got all these sophisticated audio effects, which you can only have on like a professional sort of like a PC rig with a bajillion processors and things. Like it's uh, it is very power hungry. So. Mobile devices can't handle a whole lot. Um, you will get some stuff like in FMOD and WISE will have effects that will work on uh, mobile. And that's probably your best bet to go for because they're going to have the largest sort of range of, of uh, readily available effects that are well optimized. Um, but once again, you can't use heaps and heaps of them or you will probably get frame spikes and things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, first of all, great talk. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Sound design is kind of a new hat for me as a designer. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any like uh, like suggestions for resources or something that's like really gets into the, the nitty gritty stuff so I can start learning a bit faster, especially mm. keeping accessibility in mind? Mm. Um, you know, I actually don't. <laughs> because I, I mean, I came from a, um, a music background. I studied music production at uni and, you know, learn about recording sounds and, you know, making your mixtape sound real good and that sort of thing. Um, and I found when I started working in games, I just wanted to be a composer and they asked me to also do sound effects as well on a title. I'm like, oh, okay, fine, I'll sort of do that and muddled my way through it and just fell in love with making sound. And um, so I'm largely self-taught in that respect, but there is a lot of stuff that carries over from learning music production things. Um, so, I, I mean, I think... In terms of actually uh, looking at uh, resources with accessibility in mind, you probably won't find many, but anything you, you do find that helps you learn about all the nitty gritty of, of dealing with sound design and doing all the EQs and the layering and, and all the other elements in there, um, if you approach them with an accessibility mindset, every new thing you learn about, you can think, how can I use this to communicate information? And that's, you know, every time, you know, I'm playing with a new effect or a new thing, I, I think, you know, what could this communicate if I use it in a game setting? Mm. Awesome. Thank you. Is that all? All righty. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of GCAP and Games Week. <laughs>